So for today's agenda, we're going to have a presentation from Miriam Seelman, The Power of P, Moving from ACEs to PACEs and SUD Recovery Services. We'll follow that with our CEU instructions from Diana Hobbs, and then I'll finish it up with just our upcoming Kentucky School training sessions. Um, the Kentucky School of the Kentucky School is administered through the Department for Behavioral Health Development, Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities. Here you can see our mission, vision, and values statements. So for today's presenter, we have Miriam Silman. Miriam is the Trauma and Resilience Advisor at the Kentucky Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities, where she is working to create a trauma-informed, resilience-oriented system of service delivery and workforce support across the cabinet for health and family services. Miriam also serves as a co-coordinator for the Kentucky Project AWARE, promoting student mental health and wellness through the implementation and sustainability of school-based behavioral health supports. She has worked as a clinician, researcher, and trainer focusing on trauma and resilience across various populations, professions, and service sectors for more than 30 years, including at Mountain Comprehensive Care Center, the University of Kentucky Department of Psychiatry, and the University of Kentucky Trauma Center for Trauma and Children. She also has worked to develop, implement, and evaluate a number of behavioral health, public health, and arts programs across Eastern Kentucky. Miriam has a BA from Brown University, a master's in social work from the University of Kentucky, and has completed her doctoral coursework in social work at the University of Kentucky. And with that, I will hand it over to Miriam. Oh, Miriam, you're on mute. Well, sorry, things covered up my things. Thank you so much, Nikki. Nice to have everybody here. Um, this is one of my favorite um, topics to talk about. So I'm really excited that you all are here today. And we have a lot of people. And I would like you, I'm going to pause at some, some moments to say, think about this. And if you want, drop something in the chat. The chat may get going really fast, so we may not be able to keep up with all of that. But I really want to urge you that as we talk about this topic of positive childhood experiences and the hope building blocks, to really take the moments when I make a suggestion about thinking about how to apply it to your work to reflect and do that. Because what we know is that if you can plant those seeds for how you're going to think about this work moving forward now, it will be much easier to come back to it later and think about what it means for your work. Because that's the point. I don't want you to just get the knowledge. I really want you to think about what does this mean for the work that you do. And taking it forward starts here. So I hope that you'll be able to plant those seeds, even though we are a, a large group and, and, as I say, may not be able to keep up with everything that comes into the chat, but take the time to do the exercises yourself. Um, so I am going to start to screen share and just give me one second so that I can make sure that as I do that, um, I also can see the chat and get you guys onto slideshow. So let me just make sure I have the Q and A up and the chat, perfect. Um, and so hopefully people who are having trouble with sound are getting that figured out. Um, and I wanna um, invite the, the backstage crew and Nikki that if I miss something and you need to interrupt, please feel free to go ahead and do that. All right, so we're gonna talk about the power of P as Nikki said. This is about extending our paradigm and moving from just thinking about ACEs to thinking about what we're now calling PACEs, and especially with regard to SUD and recovery services. Um, Nikki has already shared with you a little bit about our department. So here's what I hope we'll be able to cover in the next two hours. Um, get an understanding of what positive childhood experiences are and what the research is telling us about them. Um, recognize how they're connected to ACEs and how we've extended our thinking about ACEs and now PACEs over the 25 years since the original ACE study. Um, and then learn about a framework called HOPE, the building blocks. Um, the HOPE has four building blocks to build 
HOPE, which stands for Healthy Outcomes from Positive Experiences. And then think about some strategies for how you can really make this work in your work. Um, so we'll get started right away and dig right in. So I always like to remind people that, you know, people sometimes say, oh, you know, I don't know that I really need to be trauma informed because I don't really work with trauma and we all need to be trauma informed. If we work with other people, we are going to run into trauma at some point in our work. And I'm sure that that's old news for you all, but um, I really like to remind myself and remind others of this, that um, anything that we do that involves other humans means that we need to be trauma-informed. And now we're understanding not just trauma-informed, but resilience-oriented, paying attention to how to really build that resilience and move through not only surviving, but into recovery, healing, and renewal and moving forward in that way. Sorry, I just lost my, my mouse to be able to click forward. There we go. Okay. Um, I also always remind people when we are doing anything that has to do with um, trauma, that we respond to talking about this in different ways at different moments in our life. And we all may be very good at dealing with the traumas that we face in our work and not feeling like they impact us in a, in a big way or a heavy way. But sometimes when you're talking about it and you're not actually doing something, you're just listening or you're reflecting or thinking, it washes over you. It's a little bit like turning your back on the waves when you're at the beach. And when you see them coming, you can prepare for them and you ride them no problem. And when they catch you unaware, they kind of wash over you and sometimes destabilize you. And that can happen sometimes when you're in a training like this. So the first thing I wanna say is that if that happens to you, it's perfectly normal. Um, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong or something extra going on. It just means that you're in this moment where you're actually letting things get integrated and, and flow within you. And you're noticing how the trauma of others makes you feel and what it makes you think about. Um, I do want to say that in order to address that, what I want to remind you about is, and this is not a session on self-awareness and dealing with secondary trauma, but I do always like to remind people that the best way to manage those thoughts and feelings that come, whether they come on the job, after work, or in a training like this, is um, that the uh, that you want to try to metabolize what you're thinking and feeling, not just run away from it. And the best way to metabolize what you're feeling and thinking is to really talk it through or write it out or find a way to express it in some way, because that's what helps you to lean into it and process it in that way. All right, done with that. That would be another session. Uh, but just to take care of yourself as you need to, both during the session and after. Okay, I want to start out by asking you to look hard at the screen. So hopefully um, the screen is not frozen um, and people can see. Nikki, I'm going to check in. And you'll, uh, I assume you'll tell me if something is not moving. But I want you guys to look at this picture and the top three to five things that you see. Start to drop them in the chat. What are you noticing? Miriam, it's Nikki. I don't see anything moving if there's... Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and reshare. I've been moving the screen several times. So let's try it again. All right, so are you on the, are you seeing the self-awareness reminder now? Yes. Okay, and now are you seeing a picture? Yes. Okay. Hopefully we've got it, got it set now. All right. So drop into the chat things that you are seeing. All right. So I'm seeing holes in the wall, bugs, smoking, kids, electronics, cigarettes, some relationship with, re with religion, dysfunction, chemicals accessible, dirty, dangerous environment, kids not being played atten paid attention to, children unattended, um, open, messy, um, clutter, holes in the wall, animals, chaos, busy environment, ADD, food, roaches, unhealthy food. So we 
are really, really good at noticing what needs to be fixed, right? We are trained to do that. Whether you're trained as a social worker, as a psychologist, as a CADC, as a counselor, um, as a peer support specialist, um, a portion of your training, at least, and for some of us, the bulk of our training was really about a physician, a psychiatrist, whatever, psych uh, I think I said psychologist, a, a, the bulk of our training was about addressing what's wrong and fixing it. And so we are really, really good at noticing that. But what I want us to do is I want us to think about what Melissa is starting to do and Ka uh, Callie and a few other people, which is to start to pay attention to the other parts of this picture, the things that are not terrible, but that may hold some hope, that may have some ability to build some strengths. Now, I know that we talk about being strengths-based all the time, but I really want us to push ourselves today, and I want to help you do that by giving you maybe what's a new framework or a new way of thinking about it um, to do that. So the first thing I want to ask you is, Nikki, can we put our first poll up? I want you to answer this honestly. When you first looked at this picture, what was easier to see? Risk factors, protective factors, or they were about the same. And be honest with yourself in this. Sometimes we like to please ourselves and everybody else. We've got about half of you responding to the poll. You should see it on your screen. Be able to click on it. Okay, looks like it's not moving anymore. All right, I'm seeing some people dropping things in the chat also. Okay, some people are maybe having trouble clicking on it. Okay, so Nikki, you go ahead and share. Oh, I can do that actually. I can share the results. Yep. So, um, so the majority of people said that the risk factors were easier to see. And I think that that's usually true um, in this. All right. So I do want to give you kind of the science behind some of this. And the science behind this is what we often refer to as type one and type two thinking. And some of you may be familiar with Daniel Kahneman's book, Slow and Fast Thinking. Type one thinking would be that fast thinking. It's the thinking that we do automatically. It's the thinking that we're trained to do. It's the thinking that we have taught ourselves to do. And as we gain more experience, have more knowledge, and do things over and over again, it becomes our default way of thinking. Um, and it doesn't require as much effort. So in the beginning, when you're learning something new, you have to really think it through and be intentional about it. And over time, then it just becomes how you react in that situation, how you handle that situation, what you do. The problem with type one thinking is that sometimes we don't challenge it. And it also can lead to all of the areas of implicit bias. But what we know is that we have this other kind of thinking, type two thinking, which is the thinking that is more intentional. And it's the thinking that we use, as I said, when we learn something new, but it's also the thinking that we use when we want to change our thinking. So the it's the premise of cognitive behavioral therapy, right? That we can help people think about what they're thinking in a way that's new and different. But we can also do that as professionals about how we approach our cases. And so I wanna challenge you to really use your type two thinking to look at more variability, more possibilities, more options, and to try and take a variety of perspectives as you are doing the work that you do. Now it does take more effort. And when we're pressed for time or when we're overworked or all of the things that we often are, it's harder to do this because it's more efficient to use our type one thinking. But we may be creating a vicious cycle for ourselves because if we keep relying on doing things in the same way we always have, it may be that then we are not able to learn new and better ways. So that's the argument for using type two thinking. And we'll come back to that. So I want you to move into your type two thinking as we go through this. And hopefully there will be something new for you here. Um, okay, next poll. Just want to do a quick check-in to see where we are in terms of group knowledge about the adverse childhood experiences 
um, uh, study. So you again should see a poll up in front of you. Great, I love seeing the numbers go so fast. Oh good, more people are able to access this poll. We're getting up to it. All right, we're, we are at 73, wow, almost 74, and we're at 74. We just hit 75, great. Okay, so we've got a few people who for whom ACEs is a new topic. And um, most of you know something and uh, uh, quite a lot, you know, quite a few number of you know quite a lot. So, you know, oh, hang on, let me end the poll, share results. Sorry, I think I just shared it. Um, so we're going to do a brief overview. If this is new information or you want to learn more about it, there will be some um, links in the slides and so we should be, you should be able to pursue that and you can Google it. There's quite a lot of information out there. But part of what I want us to think about is what this means for the work that we do and what it has meant for the work that has come after it. So the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, the original study came out in 1998. Um, it was the result of a, a study that was happening in California that originated out of another body of work and, and, and clinical research that was happening within the obesity world. And um, what came out of that obesity study was that there was something that was keeping some members of that study from being able to keep their, um, keep their weight off. And not only were they having, having trouble um, losing any more weight, but they were actually regaining some of the weight that they had lost. So the, um, Researcher on that study, uh, Vincent Folletti, said, like any good researcher, what's going on? And what turned out was the common denominator was extremely surprising to him and to many other people. And you have to remember, this was the 90s, um, and we weren't talking necessarily as much then about the connections between physical well-being and health and other parts of our life, our psychological and emotional and social well-being and functioning. And so what he discovered was that the one thing that all of those people had in common, that he could somehow connect to the reason that they weren't doing well in this weight loss program, was that they all had experienced childhood abuse or neglect, some kind of childhood maltreatment. And when he started talking about this around the country, people said to him, you got to stop talking about this. People think you're nuts. There's no connection between obesity, weight loss, and childhood adversity. Until he was speaking to a group of people and there was somebody from the CDC. And the guy from the CDC said, I have somebody you need to meet. And he introduced him to Bob Anda. And they are the first two authors on this study. And Bob Anda said, I think you're on to something. And they conceptualized this very large study in California that ultimately had nearly 18,000 people participate in it to understand how childhood adversity and adult health and well being might be connected. And what they found was very surprising. So I want us to think about three big takeaways. They called these adversities adverse childhood experiences. And there were 10 that they specified that people answered. So the first thing they found was that there was a pretty high rate of adversity. A lot of people had had something unpleasant, something adverse happened to them in childhood. And they were particularly surprised because this was a population that you would not typically think of as being, quote unquote, at risk for childhood adversity. It was a pri primarily white population, more than 75% white. It was also a, a group of patients who were insured through Kaiser Permanente, which is a private um, health insurance. So they were either getting their insurance through full-time employment or they were purchasing it themselves. And that fit with the fact that they were primarily middle class or above in terms of socioeconomics. They also were primarily college educated. So again, not a group of people who you would normally think of as being quote unquote at risk. And there was a much higher than anticipated um, number of adversities. In fact, it turned out um, that about 60% of the population had at least one adversity and about 12% had four or more. 
Um, and so this became a big thing. The second thing that they found out, which is not surprising when you think about it logically, is that the more bad stuff that happened in childhood, the more it impacted adult well-being and health. So we kind of take that for granted now, but to have the data on it in 1998 was actually quite important to show this dose response and this connection between the dose exposure in childhood and the level of health and well-being in adulthood. Um, and the third thing that they were able to put evidence to, again, seems like a no-brainer, but at the time it was really important because we didn't have studies that were telling us this. What they said was, guess what? The stuff that happens when you're a kid doesn't just go away when you become an adult. It stays with you in some shape or fashion or form. And for some of us, it stays with us and resonates in our physical well-being in others, in our mental health and our, our psychosocial well-being, and for some in both. But this idea of having this evidence of the connection was pretty profound. So when the Adverse Childhood Experiences study came out, as many of you know, some people grabbed onto it, but most people were like, didn't know about it. It took a while for it to permeate the clinical world and to get, as we say, from bench to bedside. But once it did, it really took off. But what I want us to remember is that what's important about the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, is that it started us on this path to understanding how what happens in childhood impacts us and impacts the work that we do as professional helpers. So we learned from the uh, from the um, first A study and subsequent um, studies have confirmed this over and over and over again that among the many things that are impacted by adverse childhood experiences are mental health, so depression, anxiety, suicidality, PTSD, et cetera, and what they called risky behaviors. I think you would all probably take issue with that terminology, um, but re referencing substance use disorders and other kinds of uh, behaviors that may ca uh, be cre cause people to be at risk for harm to themselves um, without taking proper prevention and uh, proper uh, preventive measures. So they lump SUD and unsafe sex together in that risky behaviors category. And then you can see a whole bunch of other um, mostly related to physical health and well-being impacts that we know about. Um, what we also started to understand was the mechanism by which this was happening. So what we started to see is, and the original ACE, ACEs um, pyramid, as this is called, started at the third level with adverse childhood experiences. And we understood that, oh, when something bad happens in childhood, it shifts the neurodevelopment or it increases risk for that shift to happen. And when neurodevelopment is impacted, then that impacts social, emotional, and cognitive develop, uh, uh, development. And when social, emotional, and cognitive development are affected, then that changes our understanding both as children, adolescents, and then adults of risk and, and the way that it, it impacts our behavior. And then those behaviors can impact disease, disability, and social problems, and it can increase our risk of early death. Now, what I want you to remember about the pyramid is two really important things. First thing is it is a pyramid. It narrows as it goes up. So the first thing is that just because you've had an adverse childhood experience does not mean that you will have early death. It means that at each level of the pyramid going up, there is risk. And as you see, the risk goes down slightly with each level, right? So not everybody who has adversity in childhood has disrupted neurodevelopment. But of those people who do have disrupted neurodevelopment, many of them may also be impacted in terms of their social, cognitive, and emotional development. And of those people whose social, emotional, and, and cognitive development is impaired, that may result in high-risk behaviors. And then of those people who have those high risk behaviors, there's an, they, they may have this increased risk of disease, disability and social problems, et cetera. So there's not, this is not a direct line that just because you have had ACEs, 
you are going to have early death. It's just, it's a risk um, calculation. The other thing that we started to understand is that it doesn't start with what happens in childhood or it's not solely related to what happens in childhood. The two lower levels, the foundation of social conditions, what we often refer to as social determinants of health, your local environment or context, and then the historical trauma that you may carry genetically and culturally are all a part of this. And so we started to understand that it's not just about the adversity that is experienced within the household, but there are some other pieces that are a big part of this risk calculus. And some of it is for social construct reasons, right? The way we've organized our society, but that they're important to notice. Um, I noticed a question. Yes, you can. You will get a copy of the slides. I will. Um, they'll be posted with where the recording is. I think Nikki can give us more information about that later. Okay, so um, let's think about what this means and what some of the research since then has told us about co-occurring trauma in childhood and SUD specifically. Now, I want to tell you that if you put in ACEs study you will get in less than like 30 seconds, you'll get close to a million hits on, of research because there has been an incredible explosion of research. Um, and many of it has had to do with substance use. And I can tell you pretty confidently that the majority of the research that has followed, that has replicated the original ACEs study, that has expanded and extended, it has confirmed those original findings. So we're not seeing studies that say, oh no, you guys overcalculated or that study was wrong because it said that there was more adversity than there really is. In fact, if anything, we're seeing that in communities of color, in communities that have more challenges financially and economically, um, or in terms of climate and geography, we see even higher rates of adversity and more impact, more long-term impact. But let's look at the piece of the pie and a tiny, tiny piece of the pie uh, of even this part of the pie, maybe just a bite of this piece around some recent work that's happened uh, uh, to look at co-occurring childhood trauma and SUD. So in 2021, there was quite a good systematic review that had a meta-analysis that looked at childhood maltreatment in people who were being treated for OUD. And if you look at the rates, they are pretty astonishing, right? 41% of the women in the study with OUD reported a history of sexual abuse in childhood. 16% reported of men reported a history of sexual abuse. Physical abuse, which they did not separate out because there was not a significant difference across gender, um, was at 38%, emotional abuse at 43, physical neglect at 38, and emotional neglect at 42. So these are really, really high percentages. Then they, they looked across all these studies that they were looking at, and they said, okay, how does this compare, this population of people with opioid use disorder compared to the general population, which is what we call community samples? Now, if you're a researcher, you know that there's no such thing as a 100% clean community sample, right? Because in the community sample, there are probably people who have had, who are having some OUD. They just haven't reported it, haven't, it hasn't, hasn't become public knowledge. So it's not exactly a perfect analogy, but it's pretty good. And what they saw was that there was significantly higher rates of child maltreatment reported by the folks who were having, who were experiencing opioid use disorder than people who were coming from the community sample. They also looked across these studies to look at, okay, what if we look at the people who are not only um, suffering from OUD, but are injecting specifically? And they found a pretty interesting finding, which is that among folks who are injecting, the people who are injecting more, and the way they described that was for longer periods of time and more routinely. So that's what was considered the quote unquote higher level of injecting drug um, uh, use. I, yeah, in, injecting drug use was the term that they used, I, uh, IDU. Um, so the, the greater the IDU, 
the more childhood maltreatment. So folks who were injecting, but at like not all the time, just episodically or occasionally, were reporting lower levels of child maltreatment than the folks who were injecting regularly. So again, we see this connection. And when you think about it logically, it makes some sense, but it's really important for us to have these data and be able to say there's evidence for that. Um, so there was another review of the literature that was done a few years earlier in 20, wait, I think I missed one. Santo, ah. hmm. sorry, I thought there was another one in here. There is another meta-analysis. I may have dropped the slide for some reason. There's another meta-analysis by Zhang, which also found high rates of childhood maltreatment. So when I when I send the slides, I'll pop that slide back in. Sorry, not sure what happened there. Um, but then there was a study that was done using um, uh, records from the VA, and it was looking specifically at PTSD and alcohol use disorder in veterans. Um, and you know, for those of you who are, who work with veterans or know something about this, there are high rates of both P PTSD and alcohol use disorder among veterans being served by the VA. So if you look at these comparisons, um, the, in the first grouping, we see that veterans who had PTSD and alcohol use disorder, so they were they, their record said they had both, um, 55 to 68% of them reported having had childhood adversities. Veterans who didn't have PTSD but only had alcohol use disorder, that rate goes down. Now it's still pretty high. It's 40 to 55% were still reporting that they had had childhood maltreatment, but it's significantly lower than the ones who had both PTSD and alcohol use disorder. So from this, we can start to think, okay, maybe childhood maltreatment in veterans is a risk factor for alcohol and that it be, and, and also a risk factor for combined PTSD and alcohol. They also then tried to look at this in a different kind of way. And they just looked at the connection between alcohol use disorder and PTSD. And what they found was that folks who came in and had alcohol use disorder in their records, they and that was the primary thing they were being treated for, 63% also had co-occurring PTSD that was discovered after. And then the folks who had um, comorbid alcohol and drug use disorder, which is what the VA, I guess how the VA does its coding, 76% of them also had PTSD. So the correlation between PTSD and substance use in this veteran population is really, really high. They also saw that as the PTSD symptoms were noted to be more severe, the alcohol use was higher. So this idea that maybe substance use is used to manage some of the PTSD symptoms might be a part of that. Um, and they also saw higher rates of relapse um, in SUD treatment among those veterans who had um, who had PTSD. Yes, I really, really um, like what I'm seeing in the chat. So I will look for stuff around traumatic brain injury. I didn't look for that specifically, but I think that that's probably a really interesting thing to see. Um, and then um, from uh, Melissa Hall, thanks for noticing the emotional abuse. Yes. And you're going to see that this emotional abuse piece is pretty profound. Um, so I'm looking at Cheryl's question about the Great Depression, and I'm wondering if she, if I'm thinking, Cheryl's, that you're meaning the big depression of like the 30s by the Great Depression and not the um, more recent economic recession that we had in 2008. Um, and, you know, I maybe I haven't thought about that, but I think that's a really interesting type two thinking question to consider, um, because I do think that depending on what somebody's experience of the Great Depression was, that that could create some historical, you know, kinds of trauma. Some of it may be more mild in terms of, you know, people who don't want to waste, right? Our, we all have grandparents and some of us parents who have a waste not want not philosophy and are very careful about things. But it may, there may be some deeper ways that it's resonating. So I think that's really interesting and worth thinking about. Thanks for raising that. 
Um, okay, so I like what's going on. I wanna share with you that this is not just abstract, this relates to Kentucky. So these are the 2021 data from a survey of Kentucky students. These are high school students. And um, this is not every student in Kentucky. This is the youth risk behavior study, but it is a scientific sample and considered representative. And these are the number of the percentage of students who reported they had lived with somebody who had a problem with alcohol or drug. And you can see that more than a third of our students reported, yes, they did live with somebody. And then you can see the split by gender. More girls than boys are reporting. And that may be a little bit of an artifact that the girls may be a little bit more open it all, uh, uh, in some way. Um, and then you see that the rate changes slightly over the grades. I don't think that those changes were significant. But I want you to notice the bottom um, yellow lines, because that's where we, for the first time, get a breakdown on the YRBS by race. And um, so you can see that there are some differences across race, but maybe not the way that you expected to see it. So higher numbers of white students. And uh, I cannot remember off the top of my head the level of significance um, between black and white. I will have to look that up for you. I don't remember if it was statistically significant. I want to think it was, but I'm not 100% sure. So I'd have to ask, but we definitely are seeing you know, some slight differences, but we've got a third of our kids who are living with adults um, in their households who are, are experiencing substance use issues. Um, this is the same question with regard to um, having a parent or guardian who is incarcerated in some way. And here you see quite a significant, and I do remember that this is statistically significant um, dis discrepancy by uh, race. And so our black students have a much higher likelihood, statistically significantly higher likelihood of having somebody, a parent or a guardian be incarcerated. But again, we've got a fourth of our students who have experienced this. So this is a lot to think about. I also want to share with you a study that I was a part of almost 10 years ago. This was in 2014-2015, um, and many of you may be familiar with KTOS and the AKTOS data um, that gets collected. This was using a KTOS data that was collected from a, um, a pilot project that we were doing. There were 89 youth that we had data on, ranging from 12 to 19 with a mean age of almost 16. There were slightly more males, 64% males, primarily Caucasian, multiple sources of referrals, and they were um, primarily outpatient um, and in-home and school-based, a few from residential facilities. And when we looked at their substance use, they reported, you know, almost five um, different substances used in the past 12 months and 40% said that they had used more than four substances in the past four months. So this was, this was a polysubstance abusing group of adolescents. They had started pretty early, a little before they turned 13 was the mean age of their first use regular, uh, or first, first use, I think that was their first exposure. But by age 14, 56, let me say that differently, 56%, so more than half of the sample said that they were using routinely by age 14. Um, so this was, you know, this paints a picture of what they were. So we not only asked them about their substance abuse, but we asked them about their past trauma. And this is what they reported. They reported having, and some, some of them reported multiple forms of childhood trauma, but they reported physical abuse, sexual abuse, witnessing domestic violence, neglect, and other, and that included bullying, um, emotional abuse and um, emotional neglect um, all together in that. But here's some things that we also found. We actually did a PTSD screen with them using the child post-traumatic stress scale. And the threshold on the CPSS is 15 for PTSD. Um, and the mean score for all of the kids who were involved in the study was well above 15. It was 17.25. Which was really interesting to us that, you know, that this was a group of kids who had been referred for substance use treatment, yet many of them also had PTSD. And even if they didn't meet criteria for PTSD, we did some additional analysis, many of them met clinical 
threshold for parts of PTSD, right? So they may not have met full criteria across multiple domains, but they were having significant traumatic stress symptoms in one or two areas. But then you look at the difference between the girls and the boys. So the girls had a much higher mean score than the boys. Again, part of that may be in terms of how girls are socialized to report what's happening with them. Um, but this is significant. And this really was important, I think, for us to pay attention to. We have to, in our substance use treatment arena, even with adolescents, be asking about trauma. Because what we know is that we have to address both if we're going to be successful. That statistic about um, higher relapse rates in veterans is not true just for veterans. We see that across clinical populations. So I just wanted to share that with you um, uh, to say that, you know, again, this isn't abstract. This is, is related to Kentucky. Now, I mentioned when we were talking about the um, uh, adverse childhood experiences study that it, it asked 10 things. So it asked very kind of basic things that happen in families or households. Three types of abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, two types of neglect, physical and emotional, and then five, what they lump together as quote unquote household dysfunctions, which is kind of an odd term, but that's that's the way they've been presented. Living with somebody with mental illness, seeing a mother treated violently, divorce, substance abuse in the family or an incarcerated relative. But what we know, as I said, and what we what the research has told us over and over again since then is that those are not the only adversities that children experience. And they're not the only adversities that affect adult well-being and health. And so one of the things that came that followed the ACEs study was this really lovely conceptualization that looks at social determinants of health as adverse community events, the root system. And what we understand from this diagram of the pair of ACEs is that you have to consider all of it for a couple of reasons. One is that they're all adversities in and of themselves, but we also have to think about the interaction between the two. So those root causes, those adverse community environments may actually make it harder for people who experience the adverse childhood experiences in the leaves of the tree to be resilient, to be able to bounce back, to be able to get through. So not only are those root causes themselves adversities, but they are moderating factors that change how we respond to the adversities that are happening in the leaves of the tree. And when we're thinking about this from a treatment perspective, that's a really important thing to think about. And it's gonna feed into how we think about combating it with the positives and the strengths-based approach. Um, since this pair of ACEs came out, we've also extended this into um, what is uh, comes from, this comes from PACES connection, um, the three realms of, of ACEs, and we've added climate and environment, adverse climate and environment. And I think you know when this came out, it was right around the time of the pandemic. And then um, it was, you know, right after that, we experienced tornadoes and floods. And I've spent a lot of time in Eastern Kentucky, 30 years. And so I'm very attuned to natural disasters and flooding and those kinds of things that happen in the mountains. And so we know how that impacts. And again, we know the relationship between those three realms, right? So it's not just that a tornado or a flood is a an adversity in and of itself. It's that it also, the way that we can rebound from it is impacted by those root causes, those social determinants of health, that community and environment, and the supports that may or may not be available in that way, as well as what's happening in the leaves of the tree. So you kind of want to think about this as having arrows between all of it. I also want to share with you the newest iteration of ACEs. This is a four realms of ACEs diagram that's coming out of North Carolina. So they have adverse childhood experiences in the tree and the leaves in the middle, adverse community experiences in the root system, adverse climate experiences in the clouds, and they've added a fourth, atrocious cultural experiences, and that's in the water. And I really like the fact that this diagram elevates racism, discrimination, oppression as its own category of ACEs and that and recognizes that as being in the water, it permeates 
all aspects, all the other realms in that way. So I share that with you as just something to take forward. Um, all right, here's your first thought, thinking, reflection. I want you to think of someone you know who had a child, challenging childhood, but fair, is fairly successful today. How would you describe that person using adjectives? What are the adjectives that you might use to describe that person? Resilient. Thank you, Kevin, for getting us started. Yeah, see lots of resilient or a few. Hardworking. What else? Determined, strong, driven, sense of humor, charismatic, wise, smart, driven, resourceful, understanding, compartmentalized, confident, positive, humble, people pleaser, hypervigilant, anxious, <laughs> controlling. So we're getting a range here. But many of you are pointing out these kinds of characteristics that we typically think of that are connected to ideas of being resilient, being determined, having persistence, having strength in some ways, being self-aware, but also being flexible. All, again, characteristics that we often think of as having a positive impact on our ability um, to be resilient. All right, I want you to kind of hold that in your head as we move forward. All right, Nikki, time for our last poll. How much do you know about positive childhood experiences? All right, looks like we've slowed down. Oh, we got a few more trickling in. All right, I am gonna end it and share. So it looks like um, a few people know a lot about it and uh, uh, the bulk of you know something, but maybe you feel like you have a little more to learn. And for a few of you, this is new, so that's great. So we're gonna do a little bit of conversation about the positive childhood experiences study and then really turn to what do we do with this information? So the positive childhood experiences happened in 2015 and it was modeled on the way the ACEs um, study had been done. Um, they didn't create a new study. What they did was they used the BRFIS. So the BRFIS is the Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance Study, which happens in every state in the country, including Kentucky. Um, and it's a random telephone sample of adults that asks them about their current well-being as well as their past history. So in that sense, it's the same as the adverse childhood experiences, except it's not happening in the context of a doctor's office. Um, it's not as big a questionnaire, but it is getting at some of those things. So for many years now, um, since the ACE study came out, many of the state BRFIS, um questions have included questions about adversity and adverse childhood experiences. And um, Wisconsin, a group of researchers, and I don't know what the connection to Wisconsin was, but there was a connection to Wisconsin and they got Wisconsin to add not only what went wrong in childhood, but also some questions about what went right, what they called positive childhood experiences. And they were particularly interested in how positive childhood experiences might be correlated with adult mental health and well being. Um, the questions that they asked, hang on, let me move my mouse back over. Um, the questions that they asked were these seven questions. So much as we all might take issue with the original 10 ACEs and say, well, they're just a tip of the iceberg. They're not all of them. Um, this was These seven may feel a little bit like, well, these aren't the only positive things that happen in childhood. And of course they aren't. But they do get at what we understand to be resilience building in childhood. Connection to family, connection to peers, connection to community feelings of competence and belonging, et cetera. They also map on to some work that was happening through the World Health Organization globally. And the researchers wanted to make sure that what we did in this country would be able to be connected to that international work in that way. So you see 
able to talk to your family about feelings, feel that your family stood by you. So slightly different, right? Safe to express yourself, but also feel that you're supported by them, connected to and participating in community traditions, sense of belonging in high school, supported by friends, non-parent adults and connections, and then safe and protected by an adult in your home. All right. So they did this research. It was not as many people as the adverse childhood experiences. It was a little over 6,000 people. So while not quite 18,000, still a very robust sample. And in 2019, the findings were published in JAMA Pediatrics. And I do want to point out something really interesting about this. The original ACEs study was actually published in a public health journal, not a clinical journal. But over the 20 almost 20 years since that original study, the clinical world started to understand that they needed to be paying attention to these population health studies. And so this time it was published in JAMA Pediatrics, a, a clinical journal. All right, the first thing that they found that I want us to pay attention to was they also found a dose response, which was really good because if we know that the more bad things you have happen, the more negatively it can impact your adult mental health and well being. It's good to know that the more good things that happen, the more benefit it can be, right? So that the two things can try to, we can try to figure out how to balance them out. But when they really dug into it, or not, but and when they really dug into it, what they saw was really astonishing about the way the impact happens. So for people who reported only two or fewer positive experiences, so they said yes to two of those seven questions or only one or zero, 51% of that group with a low number of positive childhood experiences reported that they had good mental health. But of the group who reported three to five positive childhood experiences, 75% of them said they had good mental health as an adult, which means that by increasing the number of positive childhood experiences that were being reported, the level of mental well being increased by 50%, which is quite astonishing, right? We don't usually see jumps like that in research. And then when people reported even more, six to seven, positive childhood experiences from that list, the majority of them, 87% of them were reporting good mental health. So this is a huge leap and it points to a very strong correlation that we can see between what happened in childhood. Now, there are other factors, obviously, but what's interesting about this is that that this had such a strong correlation. So this is really important to think about. The positive does something really good for our adult mental health and well-being. The second thing that they found was that the positive is not only good on its own, but it actually can address some of the negative impact of adversities. And this was a really big question because we wanted to know what was, I mean, those of us in the public want to, want to know this, but obviously the researchers did too. They wanted to know, you know, how, what's the relationship between adversity and positivity in childhood, right? So this looks at it a little bit differently. Instead of measuring good mental health, this, these bars are measuring rates of depression that were reported. And this is only the portion of the Burfus respondents who reported four or more ACEs. Now, for those of you who know something about the ACEs study, you remember that four was the magic number on the dose response. When you get to four or more ACEs, that's when you start to see really, really profound negative effects across the lifespan. And there's a big jump between three and four ACEs. So they looked at, they said, all right, let's look at the most significantly impacted, those people who are most likely to be most significantly impacted by their adversities, people who have four or more. So if they had very few positive experiences and four or more ACEs, they reported a pretty high rate of depression. That, that portion, portion of the respondents reported a high rate of depression, 62%. 
But as you increase the number of positive experiences being reported, even with those four ACEs, you see, again, a huge drop in the level of depression that's reported. And, and this was the, the percentage reporting depression or poor mental health in their adult lifetime, not just like in the last 30 days or the last 12 months, right? So we're not talking about just a, a period of time. They're talking about their, their general adult well-being. And so it drops down from 62%, it drops down to about 38%. And then when you add, when you get up to a high number of positive experiences, even with a high number of ACEs, that depression level drops down to a little bit over 20%, which is basically um, commiserate with, um, commensurate with um, the community samples, right? So this is really, really important because for the first time, we have some evidence that we all know as clinicians that even people who have had adversities, like the people you were thinking about in your brain who had had challenging childhoods but had been have been successful, have done well, there's something that keeps them going. And now we're starting to operationalize what is it that we might need to make sure is in the water for everybody, including people who have had adversity that can help make things better for the long haul. But there was a third thing that they discovered that I think is equally important for all of us because we don't always know who's had adversity and who hasn't. And that fourth thing is that they discovered that even if you haven't had adversity, if you don't have something positive, you may not be doing very well. So it turns out that while we're always eager to have the absence of the bad, we don't want people to have ACEs in their childhood, that there were some people who didn't have ACEs, but they also didn't have anything positive. They were like in that you know neutral zone, nothing bad, nothing good. They were not doing so well. In fact, there were people who had ACEs, but also had positive experiences who were doing better than them. So what that tells us is that you have to have the good. Being in the neutral zone isn't enough. And I think that that's where the idea of the emotional neglect piece is kind of interesting because I think in some ways being in that neutral zone probably either speaks to or is on the cusp of maybe a little emotional neglect. Like you're just not getting anything, right? You're kind of disconnected and you're not getting the bad stuff, but you're also not getting the good stuff. And we see how that cannot, can be really not a good thing. Um, and, and there's not a good graph for that. It's not as striking, but it was, it was pretty important. And I'm going to show you in a minute some follow-up data that confirmed that. So the positive childhood experience is something I got super excited about because I felt like as a clinician, as a researcher, as a trainer, I've been seeing this for years. And again, just like when I first learned about the adverse childhood experiences, I was like, duh, we knew that this was happening, but now we have some research data, right? We want everything to be evidence-based. And so now we have some of that data. And so I share with you some ways that people, you know, some of the researchers and other folks like have talked about this and some of the ways that it has excited me that we can thrive despite even an accumulation of negative experiences that we flourish even admitted adversity, which we knew, but now we are starting to understand why. why that resilience can trump ACEs and that key positive childhood experiences not only can prevent, but also they mitigate the effects of what we know to be toxic stress or traumatic stress in that way. So this is, for me, this was seminal. This is really, really excited. And so some of you who know me know that I have been chattering about this for the last number of years because I got so excited about it. Um, I did tell you that there's been some ongoing research into that question about, you know, what happens when there's nothing bad, but there's also nothing good. And so I'm sharing with you some other research, some of it from before, which we now can put into the context of this, and some of it since, um, the positive childhood experiences study that also confirms this idea that we have to have good things happening in our lives when we're developing in order for it to do well, for us to do well as adults. So that's my rationale for why I am so excited about the this idea of paying attention to positive childhood experiences, not just to adverse childhood experiences. 
The other thing that we see, and this is where I think it's relevant for you guys who are not necessarily working with children, but working with adults, is that there's a real connection between what's happening in families between children and adults, which we all know. This diagram comes from the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard. And they talk about these three, three ways that we want to try and make things better for children and therefore for future adults. We want to reduce the sources of the stress. We want to support responsive relationships. And we want to strengthen core skills. Well, when you think about the work that you do with adults, you're doing that for the adults and you want them to do it for the children. But then we see that there's this really profound transactional relationship in families and even in society between what happens to children and what happens to the adults, right? So as the adults are less stressed, as they are healthier, as they are able to engage in stronger relationships, they build healthier children. And as the children are healthier, the adults are less stressed. The adults are able to do the good things for the kids more. So this, there is this really important mutual interaction that's happening. And so that's why I think for the folks who are, are working with adults only, this is relevant for you, not only for you to think about what did your adults experience as children, but also what are they contributing to the lives of the, the children in their families and in their worlds in this way. Um, so since the Positive Childhood Experiences study, we have also had a a lot of research, I wouldn't say an explosion yet, but quite a lot of research, maybe it's a, the beginnings of an explosion that has looked at this connection between positive things happening in childhood, how it, it, it they interact with um, negative things happening and what it means for adults in terms of, you know, pregnancy, in terms of health, in terms of um, substance use and mental health and things like that. Um, this is all connected to this concept of resilience, which is, you know, in for many of us, we think about it as being the other side of the coin for trauma. Mm. Hang on, I'm gonna stop and answer this question. Could a positive childhood experience be the absence of someone in the person's life that prevented ACEs? That's a really great thought. I think it might be because you here, so. Again, I think we're going to need to develop our diagrams of what are PCEs. We haven't done that yet. Um, we have some other uh, frameworks that we use for building resilience in childhood, like um, the resilience wheel and, and other components that we know. But I think that you point to something really important. So the absence of, of harm um might be a positive, yes. So this begs the question of could, for example, divorce or incarceration have a positive impact in some ways in the life of a child? And they might, right? So none of this is neat and clean. And I don't want anybody to think that it is. And that's where I think, you know, you have to ask those questions certainly as a clinician, you want to find out, like, it's not enough to know that somebody's parent was incarcerated. We want to know what was the impact of that, right? And it might be, for example, that it had a really negative impact economically and a really positive impact in terms of the feelings of physical and psychological safety, right? And then you have a whole another layer of complexity as a clinician that you're dealing with. But um, thank you for pointing that out. So you have to dig a little bit deeper. And as I say, None of this is neat and clean. It's very, very, very gray in lots of areas. Um, hope that I answer, answered that question adequately. So speaking of not being clean, let's talk about this concept of resilience because resilience like trauma is like, it's a buzzword, right? It's everywhere. And some of us are sick of it. And some of you may be sick of it. And if you are, I'm really sorry, but I hope that I'm going to give you a way to think about it that maybe will make you not be so sick of it. So here's again, Put your type two thinking on to this concept of resilience. Be open to some new ways of thinking about it. So traditionally, we think about resilience as this idea of bouncing back or bouncing forward. The APA talks about adapting well in the face of adversity or extreme stress or tragedy or trauma, et cetera. Um, but we've also sometimes taken it to mean that we have to find resilience in ourselves, that we have to create it for ourselves. It's an individual level um, activity or characteristic. 
And we, you know, talk about these things like some of the words that you guys used earlier to describe the people who have done well despite childhood adversity, persistence, grit, flexibility, adaptability, et cetera. But the first thing I want you to think about is that resilience can never happen in isolation. So if you're a social worker, you always think about person and environments. I'm a social worker. I always think that way. If you're not, you maybe have learned how to how to do that or to, to or maybe that's your natural inclination but you know people exist within a family within a neighborhood within a community within a country a culture etc um and so we have to think about all of those realms of not only adversity but also support um and as i say i think that we need to get to a nice diagram for this a little bit but what we've learned is that resilience is also transactional that resilient individuals yes can help create resilient families and resilient communities but we create resilient individuals by building resilient families and resilient communities and the same interaction happens between families and communities. So that this is, it's not a one way street in that way. So we really wanna think about it as a collective responsibility, not an individual responsibility in that way. I wanna share with you these three conceptualizations of resilience that I like, um, and that I think are more useful than this idea of just bouncing back and bouncing forward. The first thing speaks to the idea that resilience comes and goes that it exists between us as well as within us, um, and that it's not static. And you know, I said it's not static, and that it comes and goes. But it also, um, it, it, it because it's a flow in this conceptualization. It almost kind of carries us sometimes, or sometimes we may have to swim against it or lean into it a little bit. Um, and Resma Menachem is the author of My Grandmother's Hands, a very beautiful book about. Uh, trauma and racism. And I think that this is really worth thinking about in terms of what does it mean for when we are talking about building resilience in ourselves or in our clients um, and helping them to find resilience and to experience it and to know that there may be times that they are more or less resilient. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that it's gone, right? It, it does come and go depending on the circumstances. The second bullet I, I really like, this is from Thomas Hubel, who does a lot of work around um, collective and community resilience um, and connecting people literally across the globe to find their resilience in community. Um, it's quite amazing what he does online. If you are interested in that, look him up and find, he, there's a lot of free things that he has available. But he talks about resilience as the ability to stay related to challenges. And I really like that because too often, or not too often, I think as resilience has become more a part of the public vernacular, we are thinking about the idea of resilience as being strong and moving beyond the problem or the challenge. And he reminds us that resilience actually comes from that leaning in. And so in the recovery world, I think this is a really important thing to think about. And maybe you guys already are thinking about it, and I'm preaching to the masses in this way. Um, but I, this to me really, I think, is, is very important in the work that you particularly do, but all of us who are in the behavioral health world do, that we have to lean in in order to get to the place of resilience in that way. And then Ann Mastin, who's kind of the grandmother of all things around childhood resilience, reminds us that of what I just said, that resilience comes from the relational interactions. And so we are all responsible in this way. Um, Ann Mastin also talked about the idea that, um, you know, we have to pay attention to these interconnected systems. And I want you to keep that in your mind as we think about how we can operationalize what we are doing to promote positive childhood experiences or to build on positive childhood experiences that our clients may have had by using this framework of hope. Um, I think that this is pretty obvious by now, the connections between PCEs, resilience, health outcomes, and that it goes back in the other direction as well. And that not only does it happen in this moment, but it keeps on happening in the future. And it kind of is building up on itself. If you can imagine that like this tower of this connected 
activity and these feedback loops are happening in that way. And that's part of what we're doing when we talk about or what we're trying to do when we're talking about breaking cycles and not only for individuals or for individual families, but for communities and that it takes some intervention at the system and structural level in order to do that, right? It's not just up to the individuals or the families to make that happen. Okay, so let's take a moment for a pause. Um, yes, Stephanie, kind of like the it takes a village um, approach. All right, so I wanna introduce you to the four building blocks of hope. And you're gonna scratch your heads and say, yeah, we've been talking about these kinds of things for a really long time, and we have. And one of the reasons why I wanna introduce you to the framework is because this is a way of operationalizing a lot of work that we have been talking about in protective factors and strengths-based approaches into a nice, simple framework that applies to multiple professions, multiple areas of intervention. Following the Positive Childhood Experiences study, one of the authors, Bob Segge, said, you know what? What we're seeing here is not news. It's not new news. Let's not start from scratch. Let's look at everything that we have learned to date and try to figure out how we can use it to understand these data that we found from the Wisconsin Burfus around positivity in childhood. So he and a colleague of his, um, Charlene Harper Brown, did a scoping review of the literature around protective factors in childhood and strength-based kinds of things and like, you know, all of that realm and said, how can we organize these findings, what we understand experientially and from the research to be true into a framework? And what they came up with was this idea of hope, healthy outcomes from positive experiences with these four areas. And they wanted to, they connected th th these four areas to what we understand about child maltreatment, right? We know that child maltreatment is very disruptive to relationships and environments, as well as it's the result of disrupted relationships or impaired relationships and environments. Um, and that when we have adversity in communities that limits our abilities for engagement and emotional growth. And so they connected all four of these building blocks very much to the literature that we know from what happens in childhood maltreatment. So the four building blocks of hope are relationships, environment, engagement, and emotional growth. Relationships are with peers as well as with other adults in a child's life. Um, and we think about adult to adult relationships for those of you who are working with adults. So we want to think broadly about this. We don't just want to think about their relationships outside of our sessions and our services. We also want to think about them within. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Environment is this idea of safe, equitable, stable environments not only for where we live, but also for where we play and work and go to school, um, all of the places that we have to live our life should be safe, equitable, and stable in that way. And with, the, with those kinds of environments, we're much more likely to be able to have meaningful social and civic engagement. So some of you who have been doing some learning or have some knowledge around resilience know that this idea of belonging, connectedness, and very importantly, meaning making, a sense of value in the world are critical for building resilience. And this is where that sen those senses of belonging and connection and meaning come from, is through engagement in social and civic life in this way. And civic life doesn't mean just like going to the public hearing. It means kind of all of the ways that we interact with our society around us, the society that is constructed from our, you know, our, civ our, our civil society in that way. And then the last one is this idea of emotional growth, which obviously we've been paying attention to for a really long time. Like, 
What are the opportunities and the ways that people are supported to grow and to thrive emotionally? And what are the ways that they're inhibited from that kind of growth? And so paying attention to that. So what I'd like us to do is I'd like us to consider, um, and you can use this example, or you can think of somebody in your on your caseload or who you've worked with before um, as we look at the four building blocks. Um, with the help of, of some folks in the um, who work in SUD services at DBIT uh, about a year ago, I came up with this, this case. Um, R can be male or female, whatever you want any race or ethnicity that you choose. Ours is a single parent, two children are seven and four, and ours partner died of an overdose last year. Our also has a history of substance use disorder since age 16, you know, is what some people might call, and I know this is not a clinical term, a functional user, has not engaged in recovery, yet as you'll see is able to take care of responsibilities um, in their life. Ours family has a history of substance use disorder. Father died of cirrhosis, but this was never really officially acknowledged that it was related to a long history of alcohol use. And there was some domestic violence, which also is kind of, you know, kind of not, not really acknowledged. Um, there's a history of a sexual abuse situation that are experienced before the age of 18, not within the immediate nuclear family and in the extended family. Um, R didn't finish high school by getting a diploma, but got a GED and has a job, has been employed in an office for four years, but still that, that income isn't enough to not be on public assistance. Um, and or gets help from public assistance, from an aunt and from other social service providers as needed. This aunt who helps out is a very good support person to R. The aunt lives next door, helps out with the children and with transportation because R has no car and also provides safe and adequate housing for R and the children in a trailer. Um, R is reliable, shows up as expected to your syringe exchange program. Um, I think that's what I wrote this originally for was, a, was that type of program, um, but has not had HIV or hep C testing yet. So you see both some strengths and also some challenges in this case, as I would imagine. So I hope it kind of rings true um, for you on some level. As I said, you can refer to this or to something else, but we can see lots of adversities, as I said, right, um, listed here. Um, and some of them are from childhood and some of them are current adversities. Um, some of them are challenges that we would see as challenges, but maybe R wouldn't see as challenges, but there's, you know, there's a fair amount of stuff to deal with. And the fixer part of us might immediately go to this and say, okay, what are we going to do about this? And what are we going to do about this? But I want you to, again, use that type two thinking and say, before we do that, we're going to also consider what's going well. So we see lots of supports and strengths and resources, both external in the form of the ant and stable employment, which is somewhat internal also, and connecting to the services that you are offering and maybe starting to connect to other re recovery supports and having access to safe and, and stable housing. But we also see that R has some internal positives, right? R is a very good parent and takes that role of being a parent very, very seriously, especially since their partner died. Um, R, you know, had the, 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 the ability the, and the discipline and the drive to get a GED um, when that probably wasn't very easy, has maintained stable employment, um, has stayed connected to your services um, and has stayed connected to the ant, right? We often see that what our supportive relationships can sometimes turn on a dime and that hasn't happened. This ant has been there for our for a while. So what we want to start to think about is how, using the building blocks, can we really capitalize on these strengths and build them up? And how do they fit into those four areas of relationships, environment, social and civic engagement, and opportunities for emotional growth? And how can we nurture some of those areas that may not have as much good stuff happening, or maybe have more challenges associated with them in that way. All right, so 
this is where I want you to do some thinking either about R or about a case that, that you are thinking about in your head. Thinking about how you in your role as a helper can promote relationships, can nurture and build relationships with either other children or adults, with professionals, with peers, with support people, et cetera. What can you do that can, can promote those kinds of healthy relationships in your relationship, in your connection, your, your service provision to the folks that you work with? Express gratitude. I love that, Kendall. Thank you so much. Trust, building trust. Yes. Make sure when you do your um, drop in the chat, you set it to everyone, not just hosts and panelists. I'm reading the ones that are coming just to help hosts and panelists. Healthy boundaries. Yes, I appreciate that, Hannah, of knowing what is appropriate and what isn't. Um, making sure that when you say you're going to do something, you actually do it. Yes, that's about building trust as well. Communication. Thank you, Susie. Um, what other ways can you promote healthy relationships? Encouraging healing boundaries. Thanks, Callie. Good. Shared values and interests, active listening. Yes. Reinforcing the individual's values. Absolutely. Consistency. Thank you, Jessica. Um, share hope and experience, feelings. Um, show up, absolutely, being flexible, acknowledging strengths. So affirmations, honesty, trust, communication, non-judgmental approach, um, more about affirmations, consistency, willingness, empathy, et cetera, being present. Yeah, there are so many ways that you can model a good relationship and then start to help them um, create it in their life. Um, Rick, I really love that you said creating self spaces and being wel welcoming because that bridges both relationships and environment, which we're going to talk about next. Meeting them where they are absolutely in that way. So here are some things that I thought of. Modeling those healthy relationships and then promoting relationships. So, you know, how often are we really talking to people, not just about what they're doing for their own wellness or their own recovery, but how about talking to them about what they're doing socially? Now, I know you guys do because you're always looking for risk in their social interactions as well, but how can we really turn that into something positive and encourage that, right? You know, when we first started to understand that kids who were in gangs were in gangs, not because they were necessarily attracted to violence, but because the gang was a substitute family, right? That's when we started to change our ability to interrupt that behavior that was not so constructive because we realized we couldn't just say, stop hanging out with the gang members. We had to give an alternative. We had to give meaningful relationships in another way. And so that's part of what we have to think about. How are we not only understanding where they're getting relationships from, but helping them to make them as healthy as possible? with us, but also in other spaces in their life, because ultimately that's what's really important. So both those formal and those informal. And then you guys really named a lot of the trauma-informed principles around safety, trust, transparency, collaboration, mutuality, and voice and choice in that way. So this may not be a stretch. You may already be doing it. But I what I want you to start to remember is that this can become in and of itself an intervention goal, that this is not just extra or in support of other things, that based on what we now understand about the power of positivity in the role of children, but also in addressing that and repairing it in the role in the lives of adults, that this in and of itself is a worthy goal to be building healthy relationships um, in that sense. So I hope that makes sense what I just said to you in that way. I want you to think about how we do this in practice, right? Um, so things like laughter and small talk, which sometimes we have been taught are not appropriate or not professional in some way. Um, maybe we've been taught that we're supposed to wait for people to come to us and not initiate communication and contact. Mm. Or that 
old way of doing things. I hope it's old, which I really can't stand, which is that when a person misses an appointment, we don't follow up with them. We wait for them to follow up with us, with us which is a terrible, terrible approach. Because if they don't trust us yet, then part of what we have to do is reach out and say, hey, we want to we want to make sure that you're getting what you need. We're concerned that you didn't show up. What are the barriers? What can we do to help, et cetera? So being proactive in that way, bring, bringing our authentic selves. That doesn't mean you have to share everything about yourself. It means you maintain your boundaries, but that you also are authentic in some way, being strengths-based, et cetera. So thinking about how we do this in practice. So that's not so hard. Um, when we think about safe, equitable, and stable environments, I also think that you are um, are really ahead of many other people in the behavioral health world in terms of looking at uh, stable environments because you pay such attention to being in a good housing and a good stable housing and a safe housing situation and a safe work situation. And all of those things are also about risk management. And so I think that you do pay attention to this. I want to challenge you to go even beyond that, because I think we not only want to think about what we're doing for our immediate clients, but also what we're thinking about on a system level. And back to Rick's comment about creating a welcoming environment, but also helping to make sure that people are living in welcoming spaces. So one of the things that we haven't done as behavioral health providers is paid attention, for example, to what can we be doing at the community level to ensure that there are playgrounds and parks? I mean, some of us have probably, but we, don't, we haven't maybe considered it part of our job, but I'm gonna put out to you that I actually think it's part of our job. And I, I love the recovery housing movement because I think that that is taking some of this in. But to really think broadly about what does it mean to live in a safe, safe, equitable, and stable environment in that way. So how can you promote a safe, stable, and equitable, equitable environment through your work? And Monica, I really appreciate your comment in the chat about um, addressing how people are perceiving what's healthy and what isn't and um, what they deserve. So thank you for that. Um, and David, before reaching out, so you're you're talking about like reaching out to help them with securing a safe environment. Is that what I mean? That that, that and uh, in terms of informed consent, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, and oh wait, a different David answered that, but maybe maybe an answer an answer that. So what can you do to promote safe, stable, and equitable environments for the people? Yeah, first of all, find out what do they need. And you know, this can also relate to transportation, access to grocery stores, um, uh, ability to come to work, et cetera. Other things that people can think of that they can do to promote this environment, safe, stable and equitable environments. So again, sometimes when we identify a place that may be a place of risk, are we, instead of just saying, you know, maybe you should stay away from that, always looking for the alternative, what can happen instead of that, right? What can replace that? Because there's a need that's being met um, by them engaging in that environment that we perceive as being risky for them, but they need something to meet that need, friendship or connection and support and those kinds of things. Ruben, I love it. Advocate. Absolutely. We do need to advocate with the legislature, with our city councils, with places like that, providing resources. Yeah. But I also think that we have to start to think about the idea that everybody deserves to live in a nice place not just a safe place, but a nice place in that way. Um, here are some things to think about, right? We want to be thinking about everything from what's on their dinner plate to what's outside their window, um, right? I have a pediatrician friend who um, I remember many years ago when she had this aha moment that she was so frustrated with many of her families. They were mostly single moms with kids. Um, 
and um, with a plethora of health problems and mental health issues. And one of the problems was that the kids never played outside until she realized that the moms were making the best choice possible because there wasn't a safe place for them to go out, right? They lived in unsafe neighborhoods and it wasn't safe to let them go out. And so this pediatrician really started working towards figuring out how to create play spaces that were safe. Um, and and that became a part of what she saw as her role as a health care provider. And so I think we really have to extend our roles in this way. Um, and so, um, and also, yes, see, looking at the whole person um, and down to the very small things, as Melissa says, of making sure that they're comfortable in this immediate environment, door open or closed, which chair they want to sit in, do they need something to drink? Do they need a smoke break? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the other thing I want to elevate in this and this slide is this time for play and leisure. We don't always recognize that as part of good mental health. And it comes kind of after everything else. And I think that's probably been a huge mistake that we've made across the whole behavioral health spectrum. Play and leisure are how we learn to socialize. They're how we test out all kinds of emotions. I mean, think about, we know how important play is for children. It's also important for adults, especially for adults who had a lot of trauma in their childhood and who may, or who maybe missed out on certain things in their adolescence or childhood because of the trauma or because of their substance use behavior. And so again, I think that creating opportunities and time for play and leisure shouldn't be extra. It's not the icing on the cake. It's actually got to be a primary ingredient of the cake of our treatment, right? And so, um, yes, and so we do play therapy and we see how people blossom during play therapy. And we don't even have to use words to analyze it. Things just happen. And it happens with adults too. I had a, a sand table in my office for many, many years that I loved using. And um, and with and I used it primarily with adults. I mean, it was originally put in there for kids, but it ended up being used mostly for adults. They were also a lot cleaner about using the sand table. But um, we need to find those opportunities for adults as well as kids and for adults and kids together to be doing that and make that again part of our treatment goals because this is the nutrient of health and well-being or one of the nutrients, one of the vitamins and minerals of health and well-being. Maybe that's the way to think about this. I just came up with a new analogy. These are like the vitamins and minerals that go into the, the, the or these, the, these are the essential um, vitamins and minerals that go into like whatever the, the treatment vitamin capsule that we're trying to, um, to convey in that way. Um, as was already mentioned, like, what do our places look like? I think you guys all have a little bit of a dilemma about, you know, you want to destigmatize and name things as a recovery center and make it okay to come into that. We also know that sometimes that can be a barrier for people, but, you know, how do we set up our waiting rooms? And, you know, sometimes they're nice enough, like this vision of the green chairs, which is pleasant. It's clean. The colors are nice. It's not really comfortable though, right? It's not really that comfortable. And there's no place for kids right there. So I'm always Always interested when I go into other opposites about that, uh, 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 other spaces about like what else could we do in that way. I'm um, thinking about like what kinds of pictures are up. Do people see pictures of people who look like them? Those kinds of things. So I think you get the the signal from this. All right, I want to show you two videos of Dr. Segi who came up with the Hope Framework, um, showing what the difference is, and these are subtle differences between using a hope-informed approach. This, is, it looks like it's a telehealth um, situation because they did it on Zoom, but imagine that this conversation could happen in person as well. Um, and what can, notice the small differences between the trauma-informed approach and the, uh, or I'm sorry, the hope informed approach and the not hope informed approach. So I'm going to show you the not hope informed approach first. Then we'll look, at, maybe we'll pause for a minute and then we'll look at the hope informed approach and then go on and, and hear from them about what the relationship was like also. So we tested this and it worked beautifully, fingers crossed.
Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Um, Segi. I'm here to do your uh, your checkup. I'm so sorry I'm late. I've been having a bad day. I'm really running out. I'm going to tell you all the ways in which I'm really in a rush. And I'm glad you're here. Your name is um, Lori, right? Yes. Okay, uh, good. Um, I have to, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my patients, please be honest. I'll keep your answers confidential. Um, in the past 12 months, did you drink any alcohol more than a few sips? Yes. Did you smoke any marijuana or hashish? Yes, I did. Did you use anything else to get high? No. You know, it's very important to always tell me the truth. I'm going to ask you some more questions now. Have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs? Yeah. Did you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax, feel better about yourself or fit in? Yes. Do you ever use alcohol or drugs while you are by yourself or alone? No. Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? No. Do your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down on your drinking or drug use? I'm sorry, I must have hit the mouse by mistake. Hang on, I'm pulling it back to right where we were. In the past 12 months, did you drink any alcohol more than a few sips? Yes. Did you smoke any marijuana or hashish? Yes, I did. Did you use anything else to get high? No. You know, it's very important to always tell me the truth. I'm gonna ask you some more questions now. Have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs? Yeah. Did you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax, feel better about yourself or fit in? Yes. Do you ever use alcohol or drugs while you are by yourself or alone? No. Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? No. Do your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down on your drinking or drug use? No. Have you ever gotten into trouble while you were using alcohol or drugs? No, not yet. Okay. Huh, okay. Just give me a second. Got to go through these stupid forms and figure something out. Okay. Um, so, um, Kelly, right? Kelly, it looks like you're in, um, you're at moderate risk and I need to send you to the Department of Defective Teenagers. Um, there's their card and I'd like you to go down there and uh, get yourself all straightened out. Now, before you have anything else to say, I got to run, but I'll be back to do your exam in a few minutes. Bye. Okay. Okay. So, yes, no rapport. <laughs> Dr. Robot. Okay. Dismissive. It was painful. Cringeworthy. Okay. What else did you notice? Not, he's not invested. AI is more empathic. Okay. Rushed, absolutely. Telling his problems, no encouragement. Closed, asking for closed-ended statements. Um, cold, doesn't trust her. Absolutely. Great. What else? Very matter of fact, focusing on the negative. Checkbox, gruff. Absolutely. He got her name wrong, right? He asked her if her name was Lori, and then he called her Kelly later. Focused on himself, not her. Basically implied that she was lying, right? It's very important that you tell me the truth. Limited eye contact. Didn't ask what brought her in. All right. Yes, she was great. No warm handoff. Straighten herself out. Very monotone going through the motion. Absolutely. Okay, you got it. Now, let's look at some really, you know, not, these are not heavy lifts. So I think you guys will, are, will, will get it and do well. And then I want us to um, uh, look at, hear from them, because I think even though you know the differences, it's interesting to hear what they said about doing the two different role plays. But here we'll first do the with. Hi, Lori. Hi. My name is Dr. Segi, and we're doing your physical today. Okay. Um, thank you for coming in. I'm really glad that you're taking care of your own of your own health. And I saw that you came in um, on your own, which is great. Okay. Um, before I get started, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Um, do you go to school, right? Yeah, I go to Bozeman High School. Mm -hmm. And how's school going for you? 
it's been good. I get, um, I get good grades. I'm a part of the choirs there. Um, I'm active in music. I have a lot of friends. Great. Sounds like you really belong. You feel like you belong in school. Yeah. Great. Do you think you might go to college afterwards or get a job or what? Yeah, I'm planning on going to college afterwards, probably pursuing a degree in music. Really? So you must really like the choir. Yeah, I really love the choir. I'm actually, I sing around the city and sometimes I'm featured as a soloist in songs. Nice. Yeah. That's terrific because you're only 16 and you're already a soloist. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to move to the business part. So I'm going to ask you a few questions that I ask all my patients. Please be honest. I'll keep your answers confidential. Okay. Do you drink any alcohol? <clears throat> Excuse me. During the past 12 months, did you drink any alcohol more than a few sips? Yes. Did you smoke any marijuana? Yes. Did you use anything else to get high? No. Have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been drinking? Yeah. Do you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax or fit in? Yes. Have you ever used alcohol or drugs when you're by yourself or alone? No. Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? No. Do your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down on your alcohol or drug use? No. Ever gotten into any trouble uh, when you were using alcohol or drugs? No, not yet. Okay. I appreciate that and I hope you don't. <laughs> you know, um, thank you for answering your questions honestly. You're obviously a strong person. You're engaged. I know you told me last time that you watch your brothers um, yeah. after school. You're, you're really part of everything. Um, I'm a little concerned though. And the thing I'm most concerned about is you've ridden in a car driven by someone who was under the influence. Yeah. Because that, that can be a real problem. And it sounds like maybe you drink in order to, fill, to fit in because you, you have a lot of friends and stuff. <clears throat> do you think you can do anything to uh, prevent yourself from getting in a car with someone who's under the influence? Yeah, I can plan out rides more efficiently next time if I'm in that situation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Good. So I know you're strong. You're obviously doing well at school. You're pretty engaged. Um, so you ha you're you able to do all of this. I just want to let you know that around the corner, there's Susie. Um, she works in our office. She's a psychologist. Mm -hmm. And some of my patients find it helpful, uh, particularly if they're struggling with something they feel like they ought to be able to get over, but, you know, habits die hard. Um, so I'll give you her card. And if you think she might be helpful, please go see her, okay? Okay. okay. Thank you. Now I'm going to let you be, uh, I'll be back in a few minutes to do your physical. Okay. Right. So you guys are already popping in the chat. What's different? So I want to thank you for doing this role play with us. Hang on for one second. Um, and you're, you're, you're pointing out the affirmations, the compliments, the encouragement, the empathy, the compassion, the pointing out the strengths, the, the connection, the eye contact, getting her name right. Um, and you know, even though he asked the questions in a pretty neutral tone, because that's what he needs to do to get that data from her, it was not gruff and it wasn't cold in that way. Um, much more conversational, actually, absolutely. And so sometimes people are like, I don't have time for small talk. I can't find that stuff out. And here's the thing. It basically didn't take very much more time, right? And he gave her some choices. Absolutely. So he didn't say, you go fix yourself. He said, you know, if you think this would be helpful, here's a resource for you. Saw her as a whole person, as also competent and, and expressed the concern as I'm concerned, not there's something wrong with you. So lots of good ways. I want you to watch this little tiny minute that they talk about it, just because I, for me, it was kind of interesting to hear what they said. Um, I'd just like to ask you how you would respond if a, a clinician asked you that very same screening question using an evidence-based screen um, in one style or the other. What do you think it would do for you and your motivation to change? I definitely think that the HOPE-informed practice is obviously more beneficial in regards to having another support system outside of the home or school, knowing that um, your doctor as a health provider is advocating for you and providing you other resources um, to get help instead of condemning you for your behaviors, approaching it in a non-judgmental way. Um, 
seeing alcohol and drug use more as um, human to human instead of someone with a problem and being treated that way. And, you know, purposely in the first one, <clears throat> I made up the name um, Center for Defective Teenagers. But do you ever feel that when someone gets sent somewhere for, for help, that, that that's what it sounds like, regardless of the name? Or was that just stupid? No, I, I agree. And when you're sell, sent to an institution or something, you know, I think that there's a negative uh, concept attached to that label. Because yeah. you notice the second time I didn't send you to a center, I sent you to Susie. So yeah. I think another aspect of all of this is that it's just what you said, the human relationship. And of mm -hmm. course, relationships are one of the building blocks of hope. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so maybe not anything stellar, but again, like just as Hi, uh, my name is Dr. To plant some seeds. Sorry about that. Um, hang on, let's get to the next slide. Okay, so again, you know, thinking about our type two thinking in all of these interactions in that way. I think you guys got that. Um, I want to just give a nod to our last two building blocks of engagement and um, building opportunities for emotional growth. So when we think about how we can promote social and civic engagement, again, I think we're better at the social side than maybe the civic side. Sometimes, and again, maybe the recovery community is a little better than other parts of the behavioral health world on this. But we can think about this engagement as starting very locally within the family or the household and then expanding out in concentric circles, right? So what are opportunities for participation in the community, for fun, for community activities and projects, for cultural traditions, for community-based or faith-based organizations? Again, all of these things that we sometimes think are, oh, well, you know, that will come when the person is in recovery or after they've completed X, Y, or Z. Maybe we need to change our thinking and see that engagement as a part of the solution, as a part of the pathway to health and well-being in this way. And to especially be mindful that we are connecting people to people who are like them, who share their race, ethnicity, culture, religion, et cetera, um, in certain ways, but also to connect them with diverse kinds of people and communities. And so to find those balances in that way. And so I want you to think about the person who you're thinking about or whether it's ours family, like what are some opportunities for R to be engaged? R has young children. What about the family resource centers? What about, you know, the, the Head Start or the child care community? Um, what about a, a, um, peer supports that are available? Um, what about if there isn't a playground in the neighborhood and there's a group that's trying to get one participating into that? Um, and so I think that, again, this has to be seen as actually a part of creating health and well-being, not a result of being healthy and having good well-being, that then you have the time. Because that elevates these things to a place of privilege, that you only get there after you've done certain steps. And part of what the HOPE framework is saying is that social and civic engagement is for everybody. If you work in the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, you've probably heard Secretary Friedlander say all the time that we lead from every chair. Well, our society only works if people are connected from all of their chairs, all of their places. And so I think we have to, again, put this in within the framework of this is part of our array of treatment supports and not in addition to or coming after and as a result of that. Um, so the last one is the one that you're probably very familiar with in terms of opportunities for emotional growth. And so we're always trying to create those safe spaces for social and emotional well-being and growth. And again, I think thinking beyond just our um, service structures, but to how are we making sure that there are opportunities outside of our programs and services and seeing that as essential for 
the recovery process, the treatment process as part of that. I also think that being respectful of um, unstructured time and knowing that very often the people who are coming to us for support have many appointments they have to do, many responsibilities. They're juggling lots of things. They may be using public transportation or depending on others for transportation. And our flexibility and our ability to help them find some quiet time, some respite, right? Respite isn't only for when things get really bad, but we want to actually have some quiet time, some unstructured time, some time for reflection and emotional um, connection to ourselves before we get to that breaking point. That's what helps prevent us get to that breaking point. Also helping our parents become role models and become teachers for their children is so empowering. And as many of you have probably noticed, as I did over the many years of, of clinical work that I did, that when parents are in that role of being empowered teachers and supporters, they do tremendous emotional growing themselves, right? So it's not only that they're helping their children, but it's reflected back and they are helping themselves in all of these ways. Um, so I hope that this has given you some opportunities to think about how you can operationalize these things within these four buckets in a slightly different way, in a way that makes them a part of the treatment process, um, as I've said multiple times. So I want you to think again about the person who you thought of in the very beginning who did well. And I want you to think now thinking about positive childhood experiences and the building blocks do you think that, and I suspect that, that you will, and let me not ask it as a yes, no, what are the positive childhood experiences and the building blocks that maybe contributed to their resilience, their ability to be successful, their ability to manage those adversities and still come out on the other side? Um, and so um, when you think about what's helped them, I bet it will fit in to some of those positive childhood experiences or those building blocks. So I know we're getting to the end and people are probably tired of, of dropping things in. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Faye. Unconditional love, grandparents and extended family connections, relationships, um, faith. Thank you. Um, so lots of, of support systems, teachers, exactly all of the people in their life who made a difference, but maybe also, yes, sports, that engagement, um, and you know, having a, a safe, some safe environments, right? I remember that there were kids who I would work with, actually adults, young adults who I had worked with, who you know, being out in the mountains in Eastern Kentucky was a significant part of what had helped them build resilience, um, being in nature and those kinds of things. So I think we need to recognize that actually, even though we may not have been intentionally promoting it in our treatment courses, it has been a part of people's well-being and getting well and their recovery and renewal for a really long time. All right. Um, I want you to remember that you can infuse these moments of hope and, you, you know, and positive experiences for your clients throughout every encounter that you have all parts of the encounter, all parts of your program. You know, it starts when people find your your ad, your Facebook page, your social media posts, your building, call the number, whatever it is, that first connection, all the way through the time when they graduate or they decide that they're finished with their services or whatever. And so at every juncture, you have the opportunity to infuse these four elements of relationships and uh, healthy relationships, healthy, stable, and, and equitable environments, engagement, active engagement, and opportunities for emotional growth in every part of the encounter and in every way that you support them. Um, them added. Yes, <laughs> Cheryl, I love what you said, or um, or Kevin, I love what you said about job descriptions. So we're start, I'm, I'm part of the Hope National Network, and um, we're starting to really talk to them about doing some research about how being, uh, adopting a hope approach is good for staff well-being and resilience. Um, and so there's some early data that confirms that, and certainly anecdotally, I think lots of us can relate to that. Absolutely. All right. Um, I want you to reflect for a minute and think, is that, you know, what did you learn that's new? Is there anything surprising? 
Is there one building block or a few building blocks that you think, oh, I haven't really made that a part of my work? I, maybe I recognize that it was important in the lives of people, but I haven't made it a part of my work. How can I make it a part of my work? Or is there something that maybe is harder for you to do that you're going to have to think a little bit harder about? That's where I want you to plant the seeds right now so that as you go forward, maybe they will start to gel in your brain and think about this. I want to end by going back to our picture. I want you to look at it again. And you did notice some of the strengths, but think about relationships and environment and engagement and emotional growth, but also just think about like, what is okay going on here? What do we see that maybe isn't so terrible, even though there's a lot of bad stuff, right? I am not a fan of those roaches. What else do you see? There is food. The kids have kind of appear happy. They are all in one room. They have a home. People pointed to the to the religious iconography. There is an adult in the room. There's electricity. They do have cleaning supplies. They may they need to be put away, but at least they have cleaning supplies. There are toys. They have pets. There must be enough money to support, you know, the the pets. You know, there are shoes that we see. Um there is, seems to be some happiness, right? Nobody's crying. Nobody's screaming in this way. Um, so I think there's a lot of good stuff that is happening too. And so we always want to be looking for that, even amidst the literal or the figurative roaches or holes in the wall or et cetera. Um, so that's my challenge to you, my my encouragement to you, and um, I really hope that you found something. Um, so I really believe that we have to adopt this approach because we are all connected. And I love this quote from Desmond Tutu, my humanity is bound up in yours for you can only be human together. And so we have to take care of one another and we have to really adopt this collective caring approach. And I think that that's part of why I am so attracted to positive childhood experiences and to the HOPE framework. I want you to give yourself a challenge. I want you to think of one thing that you want to start doing tomorrow that you haven't been doing, you want to be more intentional about. Maybe one thing you want to learn a little bit more about and be honest with yourself and think about one thing that worries you about maybe extending your work in this way or extending your thinking in this way, because it's really important to know what those challenges may be out there. Um, and again, that hopefully thinking about being aware of this and thinking about how you're going to put it into action will nurture the seeds that have been planted today. Um, I do want to end by saying there are a lot of resources in Kentucky that are starting to really pay attention to this. Um, so you may be familiar with some of them. I'm sorry, I should have updated the slide for the recovery community, and I didn't, and I'm so sorry. Um, maybe Nikki can help me do that before I send it out. But I did want to tell you about PARC. And um, when you get the slides, you can look us up. We're a new organization. Anybody can join. We don't do anything except share resources and information. We have a relatively new website that is, I think, really beautiful. I'm extremely proud of it and very grateful to the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky for building it for us. But you will see that there is research related to positive childhood experiences and hope and tons of resources for you as a professional, but also that you can share with your clients there. Um, and we'll be scheduling our fall meeting. We have an online meeting. Dr. Segi actually came and talked to us at one of our early meetings, um, but we have an online meeting twice a year just to share updated information and look at how this is being operationalized in Kentucky. So with that, I can stay on if there are any additional questions. I also in the in the um, slides will give you some links to resources. These will all be hyperlinked. And I also always give you some resources about workforce resilience and well-being because that's another big passion of mine. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Miriam, for the presentation. And thank you to our participants for your active participation in our training today. Miriam, you're getting tons of love in the chat. So um, thank you again for having us. We're going to quickly just go through our last um, little slides here and we'll get you all out of here today. Um, let me just share my screen really quickly. And... Oops.
You don't need to tape all that. Okay, and Diana, I'm going to hand it over to you just to run through this really quickly for us. Thank you. Great presentation today. In order for you to receive your CE credits for today's training, you will have had to have uh, participated 90% of the training. And by October 16th, a link will be sent to you to access the, eva access the evaluation and the certificate. The link is listed there and it will also be in the email. And if you've participated 90% of the time, you are eligible for a certificate. Attendees that attend today, you must log on to the MTS website with the original email that you registered with. It is your identifying um, way that we can access, access your um, certificate. Attendees must complete the session evaluation to access the certificate, and attendees are responsible for printing your own certificate. If you have questions, and there were several questions in the chat today and question and answer about not receiving the previous one, if you will send an email to the website there, the email, kentuckyschoolvirtual at ky.gov, someone will answer your question and help you find uh, the issue with your certificate. Thank you very much, Nikki. Great, thank you, Diana. And I just wanted to close by sharing information for our next two presentations. Our next one is gonna be on October the 19th at 1.30 to three. Um, we do have one and a half CEU approved for this. This will be done, um, presented by Dr. Michelle Lothloff from the University of Kentucky. What families and communities should know about opioid use disorder and medication treatment. And then our next one will be on November the 8th at two o'clock. We do have one hour of CEU approved for this one. And this is health inequities and social determinants of health and treatment of patients with substance use disorder. So thank you all again today for your participation. We look forward to having you back in October. Thank you.